The grim reality is that climate change is happening because of us. Human activities are releasing excessive amounts of greenhouse gases, degrading our atmosphere. Over the next 45 minutes, we'll focus on CGT and America's commitment to covering the climate crisis and the existential threat to our planet. But first, we begin right here on Maryland's eastern shore. Tom Horton's journalism career spans 50 years. He's written eight books and produced a number of short films, all about life in and around the Chesapeake Bay. Tom, this is your area, your home. You grew up around here, spent a great deal of time on these waters here. What are some of your fondest memories? Well, the part of the Chesapeake I grew up in, uh, Dorchester County, the Middle Eastern Shore, we'd call it. I mean, it was a, it was a kid's paradise, a teenage boy's paradise, uh, just unlimited forests and marshes and shorelines to fish around, to pick up soft crabs shedding in the grass, which are mighty good to eat. Uh, just a cornucopia, you know, uh, hunted ducks and geese all winter, uh, caught striped bass and many other varieties of fish all summer and uh, all the crabs and oysters you could pick up. It was uh, by no means pristine. We're talking 1950s and 60s, but my goodness, uh, it, it was just all the abundance and freedom to roam and, and beautiful scenery, you know, it's, it's uh, it was, uh, it was a pretty good place to be a, be a youth. You know, I talked earlier about this bay being a microcosm for the climate crisis. Now, you've produced a few short films, uh, one about nearby Dorchester County. Let's watch a bit of that. I'm standing where I used to bat a softball around with my friends when I was a kid in the front yard of my dad's hunting and fishing cabin on the Honga River in lower Dorchester County. If the consequences of global warming and rising sea levels and the worsening erosion and the high tides they bring seem a little hazy to you, come take a tour of Dorchester County where the future is now. Check out the dying forests, sunken tombstones, waterlogged home foundations of communities going into the bay. That's pretty dramatic there, Tom. What kinds of changes have you seen to the environment, to the plants, the fish, the wildlife out here? Well, we're seeing, we've always had erosion on the Chesapeake uh, for thousands of years, but the erosion's getting worse. Why is that? Because sea level is pushing it, exacerbating it. Uh, so we're losing land a lot faster around the edges. I'm seeing in the last 20 years just rank after rank of dying trees, forests that were always green and healthy. They look a little yellow one year, next year they look a little worse, and you come back in five years and 100 feet back it's all ghostly white trunks. I, I'd never heard the term ghost forests until, I don't know who coined it, I didn't, but uh, uh, lots of ghost forests uh, where there were forests. That, that forest in the film down by my dad's old cabin, that used to be thick enough that a kid could get lost in it. I'd worry whether I could find my way back to the cabin. Now you can see through it. So big changes. What about the regional economy? You know, seafood is a big part of it, harvesting crabs and oysters and striped bass. And we, we still have that. We're moving more and more into aquaculture, but a lot of the cultures, the communities of fishermen. Uh, the fishermen are having to move elsewhere, fish from the mainland. Some just aren't fishing anymore uh, because it's becoming more and more untenable to live on those low-lying places. That was the place to be as long as sea level was fairly stable because you were right next to what you were harvesting and uh, less and less it is the place, is it the place you want to be. Now can any of the degradation that we're seeing, any of the damage that's been done to the bay, can it be reversed? You can keep it from getting worse, from proceeding faster, but no, we've probably got baked in, if we stop burning fossil fuels tomorrow, 
baked in an estimated five, six feet of sea level rise here on the Chesapeake by the end of the century. And of course that could go up. It seldom seems to go down. So we got that much baked in and that's enough to probably flood half of my home county, Dorchester. We know that because we had a storm surge in 2003, about five and a half feet, flooded 55% of Dorchester County. So we don't have to guess too much what five and a half feet looks like. That's right, yeah, because, you know, extreme weather and rising sea levels, they take their toll in different ways. Um, this area is seeing islands going underwater, Tangier Island, also Smith Island, where you've lived for a time. Yeah, and those, uh, are, those are unique cultures that we're losing. I mean, yeah, you lose some fish and crab production, but you can farm those, but you can't replace cultures that have evolved with nature for 300 years. I mean, they're, they're just wonderful places from the language to the fishing craft. Uh, those, are, those are going. Now we have another excerpt here. This is from your film, An Island Out of Time. Let's watch. Smith Island's got the same problems as other low-lying places around the bay. Some landscapes I knew there 30 years ago are beneath the waves now. The aftermath of the nor'easter gives a glimpse of what the island could look like every day later in this century, drowned, washed away by erosion and rising seas. But the more imminent threat is not the disappearance of land, but the disappearance of a culture and the people who have defined it for centuries. I'm struck there, Tom, by uh, what you said right at the end of that clip, where you said the disappearance of a culture from the people who have defined it for centuries. Um, elaborate on that for us. You were just on Smith Island. Um, yeah. How many people live there, and why do they still live there? Smith Island is down to maybe 100, 120 year-round residents now. When I lived there for three years in the late 80s, uh, there were several hundred. Uh, at least at least 350, 400, and a lot of reasons people are leaving, but one of the big ones is it's less and less certain that that place is viable. It floods more frequently. Uh, a lot of the forest is turning to marsh, the high marsh is turning to low marsh, and just more and more days every year, you gotta put on boots every time you leave your house. And even for people who are used to living 10 miles out in the bay, that gets to be a lot. And the culture, yeah, it's, 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 it's unique. Uh, it's a 300-year-old culture uh, based on fishing the Chesapeake, and it's going. You know, one of the immediate impacts that we have seen, and we talked about this earlier uh, when we reported that, you know, this area used to supply half the planet with its oysters. Oh, yeah. But that's not the case anymore. Yeah, well, back in the 1880s, about two of every five people fishing for a living in the United States were oystermen on Chesapeake Bay. That's 40% of all the fishermen in America were catching oysters on Chesapeake Bay. That was not sustainable, by the way. And, you know, we've depleted oysters uh, by overfishing, and now they're increasingly threatened by warmer waters. I mean, the, the waters right off where we're sitting have warmed uh, about four degrees Fahrenheit since the 1930s. Uh, and that's daily measurements average, but uh, we're projecting this Chesapeake here in Maryland is gonna have water temperatures more like South Florida by the end of the century. That's, that's not gonna be good for a lot of the seafood in the Bay. We could also have acidification problems attacking the oyster shells. We don't see that big time yet, but it is a real concern. So, uh, yeah, most of what we know about what climate change is going to do to the Chesapeake cuts against most of what we value about the Chesapeake as far as seafood. There will obviously be winners and losers, but uh, a lot of what we value now is going to be a loser. Tom, from what you've experienced here, from what you've learned here, what would you like the rest of the world and world leaders to know about the impact of climate change? Well, I want them to pay attention. We chose Dorchester County and the, the low-lying islands because it sounds trite, but you know the future is now. We don't have to speculate about what it will be like. We see what it's like. 
So it's, it's the classic canary in the coal mine, the, the early warning system. I, I hope that they take more action. You know, I, I saw today that we are beginning to bend the CO2 curve a little bit, but not even close to what we need to. We got this baked in five or six feet of sea level rise, but it could get a lot worse than that. And I, I don't think we've got long to keep it at five or six feet. I think we could adapt to that if it occurs over the next several decades. Not easy, but we could adapt to that. But if you've got nine, 10, 12 feet, I don't know if you can adapt to that. 